You know, the first thing I said to him, I said, are you the bastard of Santa? And I said, no, guy. I said, we're here to pick you up. <laughs> These ten men gathered in a suburban backyard have nearly all reached their allotted three score and ten. But almost half a century ago, they faced death every day as prisoners of war under the Japanese. They're the men who built the death railway and survived. But that's not the end of their story. What was worse, the Burma railway or floating in the ocean? Oh, floating in the ocean. You only had, you had your moments on the Burma railway line. And, you weren't bashed every day of the week. Food was short and everything, and work was hard and so on, no boots, no nothing. But, uh, but you survived that, and then but you weren't going to survive this summer. By September 1944, the railway was finished, but the war in Asia was not. The fittest survivors, 10,000 of them, were transported to Japan and used as factory fodder, loaded along with other raw materials, and shipped back to help the Imperial War effort. They tried to put a lot of us down the one, lot of, one hole on the, how you walk down the steps as they notice on the, uh, on the side room for 113 third class passengers. Well, they wanted to put the whole damn lot of us down the, the 1300 on down the one hole. Their tragic voyage and the story of the men who died and those who survived has now been documented in Don Wall's book, Heroes at Sea. I knew a lot of fellas on the, on the ship. It was luck of the draw, where you went. So you could have been on the ship. I then. could have been there, yeah. Where is it? There's another bloke in that photograph I cut out. He yeah. had nothing here, it was just a... Yeah. Where is it? Oh, yeah. There he is, yeah. I didn't know who it was, I thought it was American. Don had worked on the death railway himself and spoke to 50 fellow POWs, but reliving those disastrous days wasn't easy. Some of them didn't want to talk. Some of them just couldn't face up to it. And the few were quite honest and said, look, look, mate, I can't talk about it. But after a few drinks, we, we start talking. What they had difficulty talking about was the fact that more than 1,000 out of the 1,300 POWs on the Raikuyu Maru died on that voyage from Singapore to Japan. Not from overcrowding or three years of starvation, but because they were hunted down by an American submarine and sunk just before dawn on the 14th of September, 1944. The damage from the torpedoes caused the rubber-laden ship to sink slowly. By sunrise, the 1,300 passengers were clinging onto wreckage and rafts, floating in an oil sling in the middle of the South China Sea. Thing about it was their attitude in the first day. They were free. They were celebrating, swimming around the water, helping one another, and say we're free. The Japs can go to hell. I was happy in the sense that I was free. I was, uh, we had no uh, Japanese guard with bayonets prodding you. We, we were just we could do what we liked if we wanted to roll off the raft and have a swim. We could. So we were free. What about food? Well, no, we didn't have any food. We lay back and we talked about all the good meals we'd had and what we were hoping to have. And uh, that didn't worry us that we were thinking and talking about food. But uh, when you started talking about, hey, how would you like a nice cold beer or something like that? Well, uh, that uh, didn't do your, uh, your heart's much good, you know, because uh, the thirst was the, the big problem. Blood Bancroft is only one of a handful of men who floated for six days without food or water and lived to tell the tale. He and six others tried to paddle in a group to the Philippines. That's when we broke away from the big group. The big group were not encouraging because a few were starting to get demented through drinking too much salt water and uh, uh, we could see that they were just going to become a problem. That big group was never sighted again. My uh, very close friend was one of them and he wouldn't come with me. He said, no, I'm, I'm okay here. He was sitting on a raft up to his waist in water. And, uh, so I said to him, Lofty, uh, come with me because we're going to try and make land if we can. But he wouldn't come and could never saw him again. As soon as they started to drink the water, 
the salt water. That is the end of the first one. The chap that I was with originally uh, on our plank was a sergeant out of the 20th. Uh, he drank it. Well, for a whole day I kept he'd float off and I kept bringing him back. But, uh, little I know that he was dead, he'd been dead for some hours. Towards the end of the war, submarines on both sides shot shipwrecked enemy. So after chasing the Japanese convoy, the American subs came back through the area four days later and surfaced for the kill, only to discover their tragic mistake. I was going to hang on to the last. Whoever it may be, it was going to take me. But you really held no hope? I held no hope at all, no. I was, well, you might well say blind because of the oil in the eyes. You couldn't open your eyes. Every time you opened your eyes, it was, you know, the sting and it, it was just the pain of opening your eyes. It wasn't worth it. And I didn't know the sub was there until I heard the, the motors pumping beside me. That's the first time I knew the sub was there. Then I have no. They pulled me up onto the sub. They stood me up. They said, are you right now? I said, I'm as right as rain. They let me go. I flopped to the floor. And you, and I just went jelly. It was just your little legs were jelly. But, uh, I was on the sub. They gave me a, a rag with water to suck. They were going to clean me down. But at that stage, they thought there was... Gap planes coming over and we were bundled, I was bundled down the, uh, the hatch bank and uh, they washed me off down below on the engine room with uh, diesel in and, and then scrubbed me up with soap and water. When I got on board the uh, submarine I turned and saluted the captain who was up in the conning tower and uh, he thought that was great, you know, but I, it was just a matter of routine as far as I was concerned because uh, Navy, you always salute the quarter deck when you step on board. So I just did the same thing, you know. And the Yanks thought that was pretty good stuff. They were very apologetic to us because they, uh, this was their maiden trip, this submarine over to Queenfish. And uh, their ice cream making machine had broken down. And they couldn't give us any ice cream. And they were so sorry about it, you know. But uh, everything was so, you know, it was so unreal that. Uh, we were having food that we'd only dreamt of for two and a half years. You know, it was food. It was, I was eating rice three times a day and uh, with limited stuff to put on it. Uh, uh, if you're lucky to get one small piece of meat the size of your thumbnail and a, a stew, you're lucky. Uh, so when you're suddenly uh, being uh, given food that you only dreamt about for two and a half years, that, that was a... Uh, that was a a great feeling. The Americans still feel a very strong bond with these survivors. Oh, yes. yes, the um, Tony Hawkman, the, uh, the the crewman in charge of the shotgun party, visited Bill Kinnean in Victoria and broke down telling Kinnean that he was so upset about it, the fact that they were only minutes away from being massacred in the water. And he said if that had happened, he wouldn't be there telling the story. I'm just going to show you the footage taken by Pappas from the USS Pampanito. Don Wall's research was so meticulous he'd spotted a footnote in the US submarine captain's log. It said that photos and a motion picture had been taken of the rescue. So for their Anzac reunion nearly half a century later, he could show these ten extraordinary men a rerun of their rescue. For many years, even today, I still dream of it. Uh, I did not dream of the boat. I blocked that out of my mind. Somehow or other, that was blocked out. Well, this is those that are here today, uh, plus a few of the others, only more or less the only chaps that I know now, because the rest are either down the, down the bottom of the ocean. I had a very hard war. And I suppose we all did. That was anyone that went through this. Definitely had a hard war. What do you think about the Japanese today and what they put you through? You want my real truth, what I think? Well, I'll hate them while there's a breath in my body. I'll never forgive or will I ever forget them. I'm sorry I've got this outlook, but I can't change. So the Americans have a 
perfectly clear conscience about this whole incident. Oh, yes, yes. The POWs, POWs are expendable. They're, they're, they're expended at that stage. You can't fight a war uh, thinking that there might be a few prisoners over there. You, you know, you must bomb the target. Well, what was the worst experience? Being on the Burma Railway or being on a raft for six days? I think the Burma Railway. I think uh, I can safely say that. Uh, you know, just getting back on the raft, we were free. We uh, on the Burma Railway, we weren't. We were living in degradation. And the out on the ocean, we were beautiful, clean water underneath you, looking down and the, into the uh, clear ocean, seeing fish swimming around. If that was going to be your end, what a nice way to go. You know? A hard war. Yeah, that